Welcome to this week's Sunday School lesson at Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. This week we're uh, starting a new quarter. We're in Revelation chapter 10. Uh, kind of a recap or just a reminder of what, what we've been reading about and studying about here in Revelation. Uh, there's, there's four series of judgments mentioned in Revelation. We have the opening of the seals, the trumpet judgments, the thunder judgments, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, and then the pouring out of the vials of God's wrath. Um, as I said, we've, we've seen the seven seals open, and uh, we've gone through six of the trumpet judgments, and today we have, uh, in chapter 10, and then again in part of chapter 11, next week's lesson, we have another, uh, maybe what you might call our second pause, or parentheses some uh, commentaries talk about. So uh, we're between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, We've got a slight pause here, and uh, we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face as, as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up these things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So here, of course, we see John describing another event, what's happening next. And, and what he sees is a mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow upon his head and his face were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. This gives us a, a sort of a prelude to the way Jesus was going to come to us in a cloud. Uh, some commentaries I read, one or two of them mentioned that this was Jesus. But uh, the consensus that I saw was not that this was Jesus, but, but uh, similarities to Jesus. And that this is a mighty angel. And again, it's described as a mighty angel. So there's different types of angels. Uh, but this was a mighty angel, uh, similar to one that John had seen earlier. Clothed with a cloud, Jesus will come to us in a cloud, and a rainbow upon his head. We remember when we were talking about the, the throne, God's throne, there was a, a green rainbow about the throne. But also, maybe to give us a little comfort here, um, the angel came with a rainbow upon his head, maybe like a crown, but to remind us of a covenant that God made with Noah. Uh, he, he told Noah that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood, with water. And uh, his promise to that was the evidence of a, of a rainbow. Uh, he'll have a rainbow in the clouds to, to let all creation, not just mankind, know that he will not destroy the earth again uh, with a flood. So we have that. And then uh, faces were the sun and feet as pillars of fire. Again, a reminder of a similarity to, towards Jesus. And he had in his hand a little book. So we have a, another book or scroll, as you might say. We had the scroll that God had in, and that Jesus took. So the seven seals were in that scroll. This is a, it says a little book, so a smaller scroll. And this scroll was open and it was in the angel's hand. And it, the, the scroll was open and he said that his... Uh, one foot was set on the water, one foot set on land. And he cried with a voice as a lion roared. Uh, maybe even a, a similarity or flashback to Daniel uh, as he cried out and roared like a lion with some of the, the prophecies that he was given. And then when he cried, the seven thunders uttered their voices. And the thunders, what they uttered, what they said, we don't know. And we don't need to know because John understood him. He understood him to the point where he was about to sit down and, or, or he was about to write him down just as he had been writing down everything else that he saw. So whether these were thunder judgments, whether they were spoken or whether they were events that unfolded in heaven, whatever it was, John understood it to the point where this was more information he was going to share. But then... A voice from heaven told him not to write down those things that he saw. So 
So then we pick up with verse 5 through 7. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are therein and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God shall be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So now here we see the angel, the mighty angel that had come down, that stood on the land, that stood on the sea. <clears throat> he takes an oath to let us know how solemn this is that he's, and that he understands that he's a part of God's judgment. Uh, so he takes an oath to God, to the Creator. And there's this oath that, that the angel took. There's two essential things that it mentions in our text here that we should know about the future. The first is that this announcement marked the end of time. This is kind of an interesting concept that we absolutely have no way of understanding because what the angel is telling us here is, like I said, this is the end of time. What I've never thought about, what I've never had comprehended, I guess, or never... You know, we, we sing about heaven, and we sing about, uh, in, you know, in 10,000 years. Well, we won't know 10,000 years in heaven because time will end. The way, we, the way we understand time, everything in our life, everything that goes on around us, we always relate it to something in, uh, in regards to time. And so now the angel is telling us that time will be no more. So when we're in heaven, we won't know if it's been a minute, if it's been an hour, if it's been a day or 10,000 days. Uh, their time will be no more. That'll be the least of our worries, time. We'll have nothing to worry about. I say the least of our worries, there'll be no worries. So the first is the announcement that the, this marks the end of time. And then the angel also told John that things declared to the prophets will be about, will, are about to be fulfilled. So all the prophecy throughout the Bible that we studied about, that we read about, particularly uh, a lot of people relate to Revelation being Daniel's prophecies in the 70 weeks, or as we know, meaning 70 years. All of those things are about to come to pass. We're going to see everything finished up, tidied up, wrapped up in a nice, neat little bow, and this is, this is how it's going to lay out. And then it mentions the mystery of God should be finished. Don't, don't get confused that there's a mystery about God that we're about to understand. The mystery of God that's mentioned here is the lost people and their mystery or, not, uh, or their ability to not understand about God. There is no mystery of God to us. We know that Jesus Christ was offered up as a sacrifice for us. That's no mystery. We know that if we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and what he did for us through God's love for us, that there is no mystery. We'll spend an eternity in heaven in the presence of God and his son Jesus, our Savior. So there's no mystery about that. The mystery of God that's, that should be finished is all of the lost people, all of the folks that have to suffer through this tribulation, all of the folks they'll have to pay this price for eternity for turning their backs on what Jesus did. The mystery of God to them is about to be revealed. They're about to understand and know who Jesus is and know who God is. That's the mystery. And then as we move along in chapters 8 through 11, or verses 8 through 11, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, 
thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So here the voice spoke to John and told him to go to the angel, the mighty angel, and take the book which he had in his hand, take the scroll. And when he got there, the angel handed him the scroll and told him to eat it. But he prophesied to John about the, the scroll. He told him it's going to be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it's going to make your belly bitter. And as soon as John ate it, that's exactly what happened. Something to think about here is the word of God is not given to us for examination. The Bible, our Bibles that we have, they're not given to us just to, to read through and examine and see what we think about it. They're given to us to consume. God's word is given to us to consume, to read it, not to find out what we think about it and what our opinion is, but to know what God wants to tell us, what God wants to share with us. And to do that, to understand that, we have to consume it. And when we consume it, it's sweet as honey. If we're listening to what God has to say, if we're doing what God has to say, but it becomes bitter in our belly when sometimes we stray from God's will and we do something on our own, of our own understanding. Things become bitter to us. It will be bitter in our belly. Still sweet in our mouth as we go back and we study God's word. It's, it, you, know, you go through a daily devotional and it's amazing how sometimes you'll open up a, a devotional and the words of God that are in that devotional that day just speak to you, to speak to you personally. They just hit you in your heart and it's exactly what you need to know. That's sweet as honey when you consume that. The main thing I think here they're talking about, they, John's talking about, and what the angel is prophesying here is it's sweet as honey, but it's bitter in our belly. We're studying the revelation. We're studying the revealing of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're studying about and reading about and learning about his return here on earth. And we're thankful that we're not going to have to suffer through the wrath, that we're not going to have to suffer through the tribulation. But it's bitter to us when we think about those in the world that are out there that we've not been able to reach. I pray that we're attempting to reach them, but that have not accepted what Jesus Christ has done. That's bitter to our belly when we stop and think about what they will have to suffer. Because if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, if we know God, if we love God, then we love our neighbor as well, as the same way that we love ourselves. That's what God's Word tells us. So if we know God, we're supposed to have a love for the lost in the world. And yes, it should be bitter in our belly when we stop and think about the consequences of them not accepting Jesus Christ. So it should be motivation for us there. The Bible becomes part of us when we receive it. And it will provide spiritual nourishment. That's what it means about consuming the Bible, consuming God's word. It, it, it works the same way as, as our when we eat, you know, whatever we eat, if we're eating the right stuff. Uh, it's nourishment for our body. I don't think a bag of m ms are nourishment for our body. But, uh, but when we're eating the right things. And then it mentions here in our commentary and a final word it says no one knows what they do not know and that's the truth I've, I've heard that before you've probably all heard that but we don't know what we don't know more reason to study God's word more reason to dive into this we don't know what we don't know the thunder judgments we don't know but we don't need to know but if it's in God's word and he shared it with us those are things we need to know those are not things that we want to, well, we have no excuse there when we say we don't know what we don't know. Um, we don't, don't, don't get wrapped up or caught up. I've read through some different commentaries that were speculating on what the thunder judgments were. And again, there's, there's no reason to go down that path. There's no reason to worry about that. 
Put that on your bucket list of questions to ask when you get to heaven. Ask John, what did you want to write? What did you want to tell us? I'm sure he'll, he'll let you know. He was told not to write them down. He wasn't told not to share them with you at a later date. So ask him. Let's find out what they were. It mentions here the purpose of this book is to show us Jesus in our past, in our present, and in our future. The message of this mighty angel and the voice from heaven are integral parts of our understanding, in our understanding of how our relationship to Jesus are vital to all parts of our lives. We must accept the things which we cannot understand and we should act on the spiritual truths that we do know. The spiritual truths such as the tribulation we've been studying, what I was just talking about, this, the, the spiritual truths that we do know that Jesus Christ died for each and every one of us, not just a select few, not just for our friends or our family, but for everyone, everyone whose path crosses ours, Jesus died for that person. We don't know why that person's path crossed ours, but we better stop and think about it and wonder what God's intent was for that. Uh, everybody's reading all types of headlines. Everybody, a lot of people are reading the entire stories and there's things on the internet that you, we don't know what we can believe and what we can't believe as far as events that are going on in, in this day and time. But I read about this week, uh, I think he was a lieutenant governor in Texas and he was talking about the problems in, that are going on in the world today, particularly in our country today. And, and his answer to that was, we need God in our lives. And, I mean, it's that plain and simple. Because he laid out and said that if we, if we wanted to change things in our lives, if we accepted God, if we accepted Jesus Christ, we would turn from, we would repent, we'd turn away from the things that we have been doing, we would love one another we would be concerned for our fellow man that would take care of all these issues all these problems that people are coming up with every different type of answer whatever the bottom line is we need god in our life plain and simple that's a spiritual truth that's the spiritual truth that we do know as, as saved people so we need to be sharing that with folks around there In, in Genesis 6, 5, we find, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. That's a sad commentary on mankind. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God delivered Noah and his family. He protected them from the judgment that he declared upon the earth. This is not the, the one we're studying about here, this judgment that we're studying about, this age of judgment. This is not the first time God has declared judgment on the earth. This is not the first time he destroyed creation. But God protected them from the judgment in the ark. God will deliver us from judgment if we find grace in the eyes of the Lord. We find grace in the eyes of the Lord by accepting what our Savior Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. That unwarranted favor the grace that God wants, wishes to extend to everyone if we simply believe what he, his son did for us. Jesus is our deliverer. Jesus is our ark through this judgment. We need to be sharing Jesus with everyone around us. We think about these times that we're, again, the people. As I said, we, 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 under, we, we use time. We mark time. We say these times, the old days, you know, the good old days, the future, we have different ideas about time. And then we're talking about these unprecedented times we're living in today. 
all these issues with the viruses and with turmoil in the streets and, and people not being able to, to love each other, uh, for people not being able to get on the same page. And, and to, you know, so, so then we get to thinking maybe some of us that are Christians that are saved and we study Revelation and we get to thinking, well, I tell you what, how about we just get things started right now, God, and take us out of here so we don't have to deal with this. Well, I was reading something else about that. And the judgment, the rapture, Jesus is coming back. It's not about taking us out of a problem that we're in. It's not about making our life easier. It's not about us. The book of Revelation is a revealing of Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus Christ and about his honor and his glory and his reign on earth and him coming back to rule. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. So when we're suffering through our minor aches and pains of this life, when we're suffering through things that are going on in the world around us, we need to remember we don't need to be asking God to, to let's just get it over with. Let's just take us out. We need to be looking at what God wants us to do to help make that change, to help bring more people out of that mystery of God and into the knowing of God. What can we do to bring honor and glory to our Savior, Jesus Christ? It's not about us. See, that's the problem with all these people that are lost today. It's about them, to them. Until we can put God first, put others around us second, and put ourselves third. If you want to make a hierarchy there, if you want to put them in order, that's the way it needs to be. And until we follow that, we ourselves are going to have problems in our lives. So let's just remember, it's about Jesus Christ, his honor, and his glory. And what can we do to aid in that? And with that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ. So thankful, Lord, that you sent him to die on the cross for each and every one of us. That you sent him as our deliverer. That Jesus Christ will be our ark through this age of judgment that is to come. I just pray, Lord, that we will seek out your will in our lives, that we'll seek out those opportunities that you've placed before us, that we will make it a, a point in our lives to help clarify that mystery in the lost and dying world, that mystery of you, Lord, that it'll no longer be a mystery, but they will accept and know you just as we do, Lord. I just pray a continued blessing on this church and her ministries as we reach out in our community to do just that. I pray, Lord, for the words on Brother Donis' heart this morning, your words that he'll share with us here shortly, and the music that's being lifted up in your honor and your glory this morning, Lord. I ask forgiveness where I fail you. In your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen.